And this work is in uh, joint work with uh, my collaborators from uh, Iowa, Alex Hubers, who I owe an apology for being mean on GitHub when he used to you know, send pull requests, so I'm sorry. And um, I would like to thank my advisor, who is at the back playing on his phone. Um, so while I'm thanking people, um, we should also thank this rule uh, for making sure that nonsensical types are uh, out of uh, you know the system when programmers write it. I mean, it's a very simple rule that was uh, kind of uh, put in or formalized by Mark Jones about 30 years ago, uh, who was inspired by uh, generalized uh, type systems. So um, the the rule just says, you know, uh, if tau sigma is a well-defined type, then tau has to have a function kind uh, kappa to kappa prime, and the argument type should be of kind kappa. So uh, how does this work, right? Um, we want to make sure that uh, things like int list is well-defined, but int applied to a list is ill-defined. And if you think that the second one is, why is it nonsensical? I think you might be in the wrong room. Like OCaml workshop is you know, in the other room. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so let's see how the kinding rule works, right? So um, it's pretty simple. Like list is a kind function. Um, it goes from star to star, int is of type star. So list of integers is star. So all good. And int applied to uh, list is ill-kinded because we cannot compute the um, ki kind of this uh, so-called type. But um, you know, so the type checker can flag it out as an error and um, the user would be notified. So this seems to be working well in practice, right? Um, or has been for the last uh, 30 years or so, where um, into types like uh, int, int list are well-kinded and well-defined, uh, but int applied to list is ill-kinded and hence nonsensical. Um, so it seems like a good, very good approximation. But although this looks like a uh, necessary condition, is this a sufficient one? Um, it turns out to be, well, it's not. Because you can have things like set. And set is of kind star to star. You can have uh, an integer to integer function, which has kind star. But when you apply set uh, to the int to int function, um, it has a, a well-defined kind. But it still does not make sense, right? Because uh, the int to int function needs to be, uh, or all functions need to be ordered, but I don't think it makes sense for uh, functions that take an int and return an int to be ordered. At least in Haskell, it does not. Um, set is not just the only example. We have a ratio where um, the type parameter a should be integral, um, u or a. Um, is more interesting because both the type parameters are constrained, where i needs to be indexable and uh, e needs to be uh, unboxed. And there are various other examples like state transformers and other other uh, other types where m needs to be a monad. So it's not just that, right? There there are more examples. So we need a better support for this. So the current problem is that Haskell treats all types to be total. And this is somewhat two annoying consequences. First is that if a, a library writer wants to define a partial data type, they, what they would do is they would you know, declare it as total. Uh, you would hide the data constructors and then uh, define like smart constructors or functions with explicit constraints that make sure that you don't uh, violate the uh, properties of the uh, partiality of, of the data type which is somewhat annoying, but you know we can live with that, I guess. Uh, the other one is that we cannot even leverage the existing type plus uh, mechanisms that we have in Haskell, right? Uh, we, like, we want to have set as a functor instance, but we cannot because uh, as soon as you try to write a uh, map, set, uh, map set function, there will be extra constraints in the type signature. So it seems to be a, a bit of a problem. So the, the goal of this project was somewhat uh, to, to see if we can make this partiality explicit in the type system and see if that solves our problem. And if we do end up doing it, uh, what impact will this have on existing code? So 
how can we make uh, partiality in types explicit? Well, we are, we are Haskellers, so we can define a predicate on, uh, on types. Let's call it tau at sigma. And it means, it, it exactly holds, it holds exactly when tau applied to sigma is well-defined. And for, for, for example, um, set at A will hold when odd A holds, because that's exactly when set uh, set A should, is, is well defined. Uh, ratio at A holds when integral A holds. Um, U array uh, has like two separate kinds of uh, equations here where U array at I holds when uh, I is indexable and U array I at E holds when E is unboxed. Imagine unbox to be like a special you know type class that I think currently does not exist. But you can imagine uh, there can be one type class that says that certain types are unboxed and certain types are unboxed. Uh, and the last one uh, says that, well, there are types that are total, so we should also account for those. And uh, things, predicates like um, at list applied to A hold everywhere. So we can have a uniform treatment for partial and total types. So the, the rule that should have existed uh, looks something like this, where we have this extra uh, well-formedness uh, condition uh, in the kinding rule that says when a type is well-defined. And we need to have enough, enough uh, information in our context to prove that uh, it indeed is well-defined. So how does this work? Um, now suppose we have a map set uh, which is you know takes in uh, a function that maps uh, type that my, maps uh, element of type A to B and takes in uh, a set uh, of type A and just maps every element using that function and returns a new set uh, of type of type B uh, where elements are of uh, elements are of type B. So a reasonable thing to expect would be that the elements uh, have to satisfy an odd class. Uh, but in when partiality is explicit, we see that this exactly holds when set at A holds, because that's what the definition of uh, set at A is. What about classes? Um, well, so functor type class um, has an fmap function. And that would only make sense if f at A and f, f at B are like preconditions to that function, right? That's only uh, only if these uh, constraints are satisfied is when uh, the fmap function would be satisfied. And this exactly is not just syntactic, but but we see from the previous kinding rule that this needs to hold. But now, what exactly have we managed to do? If we line up the types, we see that there is something interesting happening, right? Uh, we can finally have a functor instance of set. And the, the, the type checker would be perfectly happy to do that. And we can go a step further uh, and, and see that monad instance for set also type checks, right? We no longer have to uh, have some explicit machinery of uh, constraint uh, of, of reifying and reflecting things or, or whatever previous work has been done. You just write your partial uh, data type, uh, uh, define operations on them and um, and declare uh, the monads and functor instances for them. So this is all good in theory, right? Um, if you were at Popple 2020, uh, there was a paper on this, uh, partial type constructors. Um, and what it did was that it said that the theory is fine, but it translated it to a dependently typed uh, uh, core. And we are not... Uh, we don't have dependent Haskell, right? I don't know if Richard is here. And I'm kind of impatient. Uh, I, I want to have this feature right now. Like, I don't want to wait until dependent Haskell uh, comes, comes in. So how do we implement this in current GHC? Uh, well, it's a predicate. So the first approximation is like, well, let's try to encode this in as, as a type class. So a class at is, uh, takes in two type parameters, t and u. And, uh, it, it, it intends to hold um, only when t at u is, is well-defined, right? So if we have a total type, uh, list at sigma holds uh, everywhere. So we just say, well, instance uh, list at sigma holds here. Um, and whenever we have 
uh, a program that needs list at sigma, it can freely use it. So there is no overhead in, uh, or, or the type checker should be e the type checker should uh, should be able to uh, discharge this uh, this constraint if needed. For partial data types, um, there would be an instance uh, odd a implies set at uh, odd sigma odd sigma implies set at sigma. So this would mean that uh, we can whenever we know that sigma a, sigma sigma is of uh, is ordered set at sigma holds. But this is not exactly what we wanted to define. We can only go one way, right? Not the other way. So because type classes do not allow uh, bidirectional reasoning. So the second way to do this is to use a type family because you know we have that power. So we just define a type family uh, at that takes in the same two uh, t and u uh, of types of the right kind. And we say that we equate this to a constraint. So for total types, uh, list at sigma uh, holds trivially. So this is just an empty uh, a unit constraint, and we know that a unit constraint can be easily satisfied. For sets uh, or partial data types, uh, we equate that to odd odd uh, for for sets. We have set at sigma is equal to odd sigma. So we see that this bidirectional property is trivially satisfied, and this is exactly what we need. So this looks promising, um, but where do all these add constraints come from, right? How do we wire them in our compiler? And if we do, we now have more constraints. So uh, the second question would be, are there any programs that are no longer typable? So let's let's tackle the first one. Um, well, we are at ICFP and elaboration is our bread and butter. So we use that, right? Uh, for any type signature that we see, uh, we reverse the type signature and see if there are any type applications and just pull out the constraints uh, as as what we would need where m at b uh, would 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 correspond to the m at b constraint that is uh, in the context the next thing uh, that we would want to do is to see what how can we associate the partiality of the data type, right? We need something that elaborates uh, to, to this particular type instance that says that set at A holds exactly when odd A holds. Well, there is something that Haskell already has, right? It's, it's not loved enough, but I think it should be. Now, we can finally use this. I think this is the prime moment of uh, data type context uh, lang language extension. So, we can now have an elaboration for data types as well, where um, the user writes this, which is kind of an intuitive syntax as well, and and this would automatically elaborate to the uh, to to the correct type uh, at constraints uh, equalities. So, are there any programs that are no longer typable? Um, this was this is the start of an empirical study, right? Because just by having these rules, we are not sure if you know everything would would work out. It so happens that there are. Um, so consider uh, this uh, app FA uh, type. Uh, you might recognize this from um, the GHC generics library. And with our elaboration procedure, uh, we would elaborate the data type and generate two equations that says that app at F holds everywhere and app f at a holds everywhere as well. Now, make app is, is actually a, uh, is treated as a function, although it's, it's a data constructor. Uh, and that has this existential constraint f at a due to the elaboration of uh, the type signature for make app. Now let's try to define a functor instance of, uh, of app f. Right. Uh, if f is a functor, it seems reasonable to have uh, to have a functor instance for app f. But it fails because make app uh, needs f at b uh, constraint to hold, and there is no way to prove that. So it seems that we are in a fix. One solution is to acknowledge that this type is actually partial. Right. It makes sense only when f at a holds. So this is what the user might have uh, would want to write in the in in as as the new uh, data type definition for app, and then we see that everything works as it should, because from 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 the constraints in in the 
in the type, we can now derive that from at f at b, f at b holds. And everything works fine. But, but this is not the only way, right? We can enforce this at the instance level as well. We can define or, or we can say that, well, it's f need not just be a functor, but it might be defined on all types of uh, A. So we enforce that at the, uh, at the instance level, and now the type checker is happy. We would need this, this later as well. So we abstract this out as a special type class total f. Uh, and to, to mean that it is well-defined on all types. So, well, you might be thinking that there, there, there were these two options of, uh, of, of writing app FA, right? And we might have as well chosen to automatically elaborate this, uh, this argument out to uh, the data type context. But we don't want to do that because we want the user to decide what it exactly should be because they, they, they mean different things. So are there programs that are no longer typable? Yes, sometimes. Um, and we have two ways to fix them. So now, how often is this sometimes, right? Now we need to go uh, take our tool and test it out. Um, and the, we need some code base uh, to, to be able to judge how, how good we are doing. Now, the, the, the best way to find or to know about the world is to look within, right? There have been religions that uh, that are based on this principle. So we just, you know, use GHC to do it. Um, so the, in this case study, we bootstrap GHC compiler and all the associated core libraries with it. Um, and then we try to count the number of uh, changes that we have to do in the type. And the second constraint that we have is that we make no term, no changes at term level. Right? Because essentially, this is just a type, type checking thing. So we should not be uh, changing any uh, term level definitions. And after we do this experiment, everything works fine. GHC, GHCI actually comes up and runs fine. Um, and we see that there is less than 10% of uh, overall changes that we have to do in the type checking chip. So uh, now we need to see why we need these changes. right? So compiler uh, itself needed about 7% uh, of changes in classes and instances, uh, and about 1.3% in term signatures, which seems kind of OK, uh, pretty small for term signatures. For libraries, we see that it seems to be the biggest share, about 9.7% is for the classes and instances. Right. Um, so let's try to dig in as to what is the problem here. Uh, the top three libraries that uh, that had to have a major change were uh, Transformers, Base, and MTL. And it might be concerning to see that you know there's about 86 or 86 percent of changes that we had to do, and and these account for like the 60 percent of the overall number that we have for libraries. So if we can get this number down, it would be a good start, right? So let's see what what why uh, why do we need to change so many signatures? You might have noticed that I have spoken about uh, functor and monad, and there is one bit missing, right? The applicative type class. I've I've not spoken about that. So let me uh, remind you of what the applicative type class is, although you know what it is. Um, it has three functions: pure, splat, and lift a2. And splat and lift a2 are defined in terms of each other, right? Um, and in the elaborated world, we now have these extra constraints floating around. And we see that lift A2 no longer type checks. And the reason why is that fmap requires an extra f at b to c constraint uh, due to you know, this guy here. Uh, is, so fmap demands that. Well, actually, even splat demands that, which cannot be satisfied. Right? So lift A2, uh, lift A2's type signature is not strong enough to, uh, to to account for the constraints that we need to hold. So the easy solution is to just declare that it is total, right? Um, because we know that f at uh, the function type needs to hold for splat to hold. So we declare that as total, and now it type checks, right? Everyone's happy. But now applicative is kind of just a super class for a lot of type classes, so the change is kind of pervasive, and it you need to add totals to all the uh, all the type classes that uh, transitively depend on applicative. 
So applicative is to blame. And um, let's see, let, let's dig in deeper as to what it would exactly mean for, uh, for, for, for a partial, partial applicative instance, right? So let's try to define an applicative set. Uh, and we see that splat now has this uh, weird constraint, like set at function type. Now, what, what does that this even mean, right? We need, this means that we need to have an ordering on functions. But as we previously noted, this kind of does not make sense for uh, Hask Haskell programs. So how do we solve this? Uh, it's, it, it seems that there is a long lost cousin of, of applicative called monoidal which is equally expressible uh, as, uh, which, which is equally expressive as applicative in, in Haskell. And this seems to do its job pretty well, right? We can now, uh, so, so monoidal has two functions, unit and bowtie, uh, which, which, which are pretty simple. And we can now define an, an, uh, a monoidal instance for set and it type checks. Uh, Monad can then have a superclass of monoidal instead of applicative, and every, everyone is happy. So in this case study, um, we did not go through uh, you know, changing uh, applicative uh, to monoidal because this is a pervasive change, right? And plus our constraint was that we did not want to change code, right? So a few years ago, I think we had this change from you know, this applicative being shoved in between uh, functor and monad. Was that really a good idea? Um, well, if you want explicit partiality, it definitely seems that it is not a good idea. But I mean, I think it's we as a community need to decide whether it was a, a good idea and maybe change uh, it to something better. So in the paper, um, we we talk about partial GADTs, type families, data families, new types, because all of this, this now needs to be accounted for when we have explicit partiality in the type system. And there are certain you know, dirty details of the implementation. So uh, this concludes my talk. Uh, we have, I mean, this is not just theory. Uh, this is Haskell Symposium. So all of this is you know, available on the web. Uh, you're encouraged to play around and let me know how it works. And I'm ready to take questions, I guess. Thank you. Thank you.